lesser God. They say they worship a lesser. You, you're saying that we're sons of a lesser God than yours. And see, the key thing about life is, here's the key thing. There is a force, like what I think it's John Austin or, or what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy in the light. Or I was like, say there is a force that's an evil force that perpetrates humanity. Uh -huh. And that evil force, his job is to deceive you, to paint a picture which is similar to the truth. Jason and I like watch a whole lot of uh, different shows that deal with spies, and one of them I think is called Legends right now. And they're talking about the best lie is the one that has nuggets of the truth within it. Nuggets of the truth within it. And then you deviate. But those who do not study the word of truth will always be deceived. That's why it's really sad. I think it's interesting how different Christians go around preaching about the rapture. And Jesus coming. Whatever year it's going to be. Jesus coming. He needs to kill our land. We're talking about all these. We are, here, especially here in America. We have a city called. I mean they blatantly call it the city of sin. And people want that nation to go down. You really don't understand eternity and damnation and rejection. Because if you really did, you would not pray for that day to come. When you have a full understanding, when you grow up, something when you grow up, when you mature in life and in the faith, you see why God dragged, if you would, he doesn't, I'm saying the spirit of the spirit, why he slows his return. And again, the prophets in the Old Testament, we'll get to uh, Genesis. The children of Israel got used to whenever God would send a prophet to them and, inform, and give them a warning about their sins, wanting them to reject, to reject their sins, to discard it. And they got used to it. They found out that God would give you warning in advance. Mm -hmm. And so what God did in response, he told that prophet, hold on, the vision will come. It may delay. But it will come to pass. Uh -huh. And one time they kept on the plan so far, he's like, no, 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 hold on now. This will come in your lifetime. And so what happens is people in the Christian faith don't think long term. Amen. If Jesus were to come today, uh -huh. and he were to cast down judgment, because whenever Jesus comes, judgment comes. Amen. There won't be any more discussion. Amen. Right now is a time where you can debate. That's right. You can debate and have your philosophy. Uh -huh. And he'll talk to you. He'll, he'll discuss it with you. Mm -hmm. But when he comes in his physical manifestation, that's it. And damnation, what is that? It's not a curse, but it just means you are trapped. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're bound okay. for eternity. There's this one faith that really believes that God isn't that bad of God. And remember, God isn't a bad God. He's a good God. Amen. He's a very good God. But whenever you get sent to Hades, the place or the abode of the dead, you're trapped. That's right. You can't come back. Amen. You have made a decision. That's right. I'm skipping along and hopefully it all connects. I believe it will. But one person that's talking about online, especially when you're going online, there's a whole lot of keyboard warriors. <laughs> People like to argue. And they like to the debate. Talking about, well, I'm not going to go to your heaven or to your Christian hell. I think it's interesting in the Old Testament. God never calls heaven a Christian heaven. Uh -huh. And he never calls Hades a Christian Hades. Amen. In fact, the people that are trapped down there never debate about whether that's a Christian Hades that's or right. Buddhist Hades uh -huh. or Muslim Hades or Islamic Hades. Uh -huh. They come down and they see, ah, and this is written in the scriptures. Amen. This is found in the book of Jeremiah, if it's not Jeremiah, it's Ezekiel. They come down, so now you're here, trapped with us where the worm does not die. You're trapped. Amen. People need to really understand the truth about eternity. Right. But good news is, someone say the good news is, the good news is you don't have to go there. Amen. In fact, Jesus doesn't even want to deal with it so much. Throughout his public ministry, you can only count on the hand how many times he talks about Hades. Mm -hmm. He keeps on talking about the kingdom of heaven. Because whenever you show people the reality of heaven and the reality of the true and the living, Amen. you've given them an opportunity. To accept God in love, not in fear. 
but in love and in knowledge and in understanding. There's no darkness. Someone say there's no darkness. There's no darkness. He'll send someone your way to be the light of heaven, to be a prophet, or to be a teacher. And that's what we're dealing with today. We're looking in the book of Genesis, chapter 20. And if you study during our trek through Abraham's life, the friend of God, we're making pit stops. Some say we're making pit stops. We're making pit stops. We've got time. This is Sunday morning Bible class. Amen. We're making pit stops. Amen. Learning about the journey of life. Because as Paul taught us, the Old Testament is a schoolmaster. Some say it's a schoolmaster. It's a, schoolmaster. It's a teacher. It shows us, allows us to see things in humanity and life that are for our reproof, Amen. for our doctrine, for us to educate ourselves, to lay aside certain weights which may beset us. Amen. Yes, it does. I'm saying yes, it does. Yes, it, does. it teaches us that there are every man and woman in Amen. life Amen. goes through trials, tests, Amen. and temptations. Amen. But if you're with God, He will always Amen. make a way of escape. The Bible teaches us that every man, some say every man, every man. and every woman and every has been given a measure of faith. faith. Every individual life yeah. has been given a measure of faith. The Bible also teaches us that in combination with that, that God has put eternity into the heart of men and women. Amen. And you have a guiding compass which will lead you to God. Or you can choose to allow it to lead you away from God. Abraham, some say Abraham, Abraham was one of these individuals. <laughs> if you say, if you remember our studies, we found out that God called Abraham. And Abraham wasn't a special or a super intelligent individual. He was just a man that chose to obey God. Amen. He was a Gentile by birth. Oh my God. Abraham? Yes, he was. Amen. He was a Gentile by birth. But God called him about a darkness. And brought him into light. Amen. But during that life, God talked to him. He gave him an offer that he couldn't refuse. And he gave him an overarching thing. If you study the book of Genesis, Abraham's life, chapters 16 through May. Well, his goes on. I'm going to 40, because he's dealing with his grandkids. I'm going to go 42. Through Genesis 42. There's an overarching thing about the promises of God. Uh -huh. And as Sarah said, he's faithful. Faithful, that promise. promise. That's the overarching thing. Yeah. He's faithful. That promise. promise. Never let your faith waver. So say, never let it waver. Never let it waver. If you fought him, get right on back on him, just like Abraham did. Amen. But throughout that overarching thing, there are different pit stops along the way. Uh -huh. And when you study Abraham's life, which is similar to our life, he would go over certain things over. And over Amen. again. It almost leads you to believe that the writer of Genesis was repeating himself. Uh -huh. No, nah, that's just the way life is. Right. Remember the third king of Israel, King Solomon, one of the wisest kings, and I love him. He was a man, he had weaknesses. He had his proclivities. Yes, he had his dalliances. But he tried to please God. And that's the same way with Abraham. One of the main things of Abraham was he was dealing with his faith and he would, when faced with challenges, he would resort to the old way of doing things. And remember during Abraham's time, there was no Jesus. Uh -huh. There, I'm like, let me take it back. Some said, Tim, take it back. Jesus did not come here in the physical manifestation and in the office of the Son of God at that time. He did not shed his blood. I'm make sure I'm biblically accurate. He did not shed his blood at that time. It wasn't time for that. So I say, it wasn't time for that. It wasn't time for that. It wasn't time for that. During that dispensation, men and women cast their sins upon a scapegoat or made sacrifices which were pleased and aroma to God. So their sins were covered for a moment, for a section. Abraham did not have a new spirit like we have in a new faith, in the faith. Once we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord, that's what means he's our captain, uh -huh. he's our guide, he's the rudder, he steers the ship. Amen. And we humble ourselves to him. 
He gives you a new spirit. Some say a new spirit. That's so why whenever a new Christian is coming to the faith, you can always tell there something about a new Christian. <coughs> like a little, something a little bit shiny. He's excited and ready to go. Amen. But it always done with the soul. Your desires, your emotions, your intellect, and your body, which haven't been renewed. And the Bible tells us about the mind, it's in opposition to God the way it is right now because it has been renewed. Same way with the body. And you're constantly struggling or wrestling with that. That's what Abraham dealt with. God called him and gave him a new man, a new man. But he's still doing with the old way of doing things. He's a good man. Man, he still struggles uh-huh. with life. Let's go into this. The book of Genesis chapter 20. My caption says, Abraham deceives Abimelech. Someone say, Abraham, Abraham deceives, deceives Abimelech. Abimelech. How well can a man who is a friend of God deceive another individual? He's still doing with that old way of doing things. Yeah. And the good thing about God is he won't beat you across the head. He'll work with you. Amen. Step by step. Some say step by step. step, by step. Day, by day. day by day. And we need to be patient with ourselves and with others. If, if you're just as patient with yourself as, and with others as God is with you, you'd be amazed about the things that God will do in your life and for others. Amen. And that's one of the things that one reason why God called Abraham. Abraham wasn't just to be saved for himself, Amen. but he was to be an example for himself, his immediate family. His extended family for the land of Palestine, for Egypt, for Chaldea, <laughs> for Mesopotamia, uh-huh. and for the world. Bless God. <laughs> and this whole entire life, this whole entire section, took him 25 years to receive the manifestation that God gave him. Amen. Why did it take him 25 years? Have you ever wondered about that? I like what Paul says, because we always got to combine the old with the new. He's talking, he's writing his letters to the different his disciples in the different churches. And he's talking about he runs this race. And he wants to make sure he keeps his body under. So in the last time, he won't be disqualified. Uh-huh. <laughs> God was working with Abraham because you're going to be my example, Abraham. I need you to be the example for humanity. And I'm going to deal with you step by step. Through our struggles, we found out that Abraham's faith has been tested and has been increasing, if you would, as he just starts to depend more and more on God. We talked about how he went down to Egypt and how he lied the first time. Uh-huh. But then God delivered him. So he's learning how to depend. Okay, well, if I tell the truth, God is going to protect me. So he went on up, he went over to Sodom and Gomorrah's area, and he's learned how to trust in God. Jason did a great job dealing with one of his contemporaries, Lot, who's trying to copy him, but he just couldn't quite get it right. Amen. So Abraham had to deliver him, and he learned that God will be a defender for him. Uh-huh. He's in his walk in life, same way with us. And God protected him. What was it 85 men? He destroyed four or five kings. God uh-huh. protected him. Abraham is still walking with God. Let's go on. He says, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 1. Now Abraham moved south to the Negev and settled for a while between Kadesh and Shur at a place called Gerar. Abraham told people there that, there he goes again, telling a half truth, that his wife Sarah was his sister. So King Abimelech the word Abimelech means wise counsel. And we believe more than likely that this was a title given to the Philistine kings. Mm-hmm. That could have been a real man, uh, King Abimelech. One reason why people were questioned about that because the same title was given to another King Abimelech in chapter 27 of Genesis. And he's dealing with Isaac. If you want to know whether or not the same person. Could be, but more than likely it's probably a name or a title given to the kings. So he's dealing with wise counsel. So King Abimelech sent for her and had her brought to him at his palace. But one night, so say one night, night. God came to Abimelech in a dream 
and told him, You are a dead man. For that woman you took is married. Verse 4, and then Abimelech said, Philistine. But Abimelech had not slept with her yet, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent man? Abraham told me she is my sister, and she herself said, Yes, he is my brother. I acted in complete innocence. And God speaking, Yes, I know you are innocent, God replied. That is why I kept you from sinning against me. So I'm saying, hmm. hmm. I did not let you touch her. Now return her to her husband, and he will pray for you. For he is a prophet. Then you will live. But if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and your entire household will die. Verse 8, Abimelech got up early the next morning and hastily called a meeting of all his servants. When he told them what had happened, great fear swept through the crowd. Then Abimelech called for Abraham. What is this you have done to us? He demanded. What have I done to you that deserves treatment like this? Making me and my kingdom. Some say kingdom. kingdom. Guilty of this great sin. This kind of thing should not be done. Why have you done this to us? Abraham speaking. Well, Abraham said, I figured. Some say, I figured. I figured this to be a godless place. I thought. Some say, I thought. They will want my wife and will kill me to get her. Besides, she is my sister. We both had the same father through different mothers, and I married her. When God sent me to travel far from my father's house, I told her, wherever we go, have the kindness to say that you are my sister. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and servants, both men and women, and gave them to Abraham. And he returned his wife Sarah to him. Look over my kingdom. And choose a place where you would like to live, Abimelech told him. Then he turned to Sarah, look, he said, I'm giving your brothers a thousand pieces of silver to compensate for any embarrassment I may have caused you. This will settle any claim against me in this matter. Verse 17, then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and the other women of the household so they could have children. For the Lord had stricken all the women with infer infertility as a warning to Abimelech for having taken Abraham's wife. Some say note. No. Note. Basically, this same occurrence happened a little bit further down south in Egypt, in the land of Ham. Some say in the land of Ham. Ham. But I think it's interesting when you check that. I think it's chapter 17. I think it's chapter 12. Chapter 12. And whenever you deal with that, Abraham went down the first time. But that nation and that king did not have the relationship that Abimelech had with God. Uh -huh. So I'm saying, hmm. Whenever Abraham went down there the first time to Egypt, God didn't speak to Pharaoh in a dream. He just caused a plague to come on the nation. <laughs> he didn't apologize to Abraham. In fact, whenever they left land, Abimelech said before they left on, choose wherever you want to go throughout my kingdom. Where do you want to live? Pharaoh didn't do that. He issued them out the land. That tells me and leads me to believe that God has men and women in every nation, in every land. They may not follow God as closely as you or I may, but they still love him. God spoke to this man in a dream. And I think it's interesting when Abimelech talked to him, he called him Lord. Amen. <laughs> so say, hmm. Mm. God's teaching Abraham, don't judge other men like others do. Remember he told Samuel, I don't see men as men see them. I judge them by their heart. Amen. That tells me that king had a heart for the Lord. Amen. Remember, he was a Philistine. Uh -huh. See, that's the same way it is in the church. As it's sad about the church, the church, we segment ourselves. We have Protestants and we have non-Protestants. We have the black church, we got the white church. Uh -huh. We've got Lutherans, we got Baptists. We got Episcopalians, we got evangel evangelicals. Segmenting the church, dividing and conquering. You look a little bit differently than I do. Especially whenever someone passes away and they get resuscitated and they come back, well, not to dream or reality. And they said he visited heaven. One of the key things people like to hear about who's up there. 
What kind of music are they playing up there? They're trying to validate whether or not their worship <laughs> is in line with God's. Because yours is inferior. That's not right. Isn't that amazing how the more things change, the more they stay the same? Same thing that remember Abraham? Remember, he's a friend of God. So I said, he's a friend of God. I figured that this is a godless layer. <laughs> but God spoke to that king in a dream. <laughs> this was a learning opportunity for both men and their lives. Remember Abraham, whenever he took down his four or five kings, men over his 85 men? Yeah, I'm going to take you down. What? Back up, back up. And then who came out to meet him? Melchizedek, who was the high priest of that land, who had a deeper understanding of the God of heaven than Abraham did, who wasn't a Chaldean like Abraham, but he loved the Lord. In the Old Testament. Some say the Old, the Old Testament. Testament. I, think, I think I talked about this earlier. There's a certain nation, and I'm running out of time. There's a certain nation in Africa. I believe the, the Egyptians, they said those were the gods lived. It's a little bit further down south from Egypt. I think it was this modern day Sudan and Ethiopia. And they were talking, one of their scriptures about the creation of heaven and earth began like this. And I can read it out of the Bible. It began like this. Can I read it real quick? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's about how the world was spoken into. These are black people talking about this. In the Old Testament, every man and every woman in their heart know the truth. Amen. It's up to you to allow that consciousness to be seared. Amen. Many Christians can allow their consciousness or their love for the Lord to be seared in their life. Uh -huh. Our job is to allow our heart to always be soft and malleable, and it's just flexible, Amen. malleable to the word of truth. How do I do this, Tim? I have to do what we talked about about two years ago. I have to do two key things. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. How do you make sure you do this? Every day have a prayer life. It's, I think it's interesting how there are many things that Satan attacks you with. One of the key things is, is to do through distraction. Amen. He never wants you to have time with prayer. Because prayer is your conduit to heaven. Prayer is, prayer is your account to heaven. Prayer is your pipeline uh -huh. to heaven. Uh -huh. Prayer is the highway to heaven. Amen. It allows you to be in constant communication and fellowship with God. And if you are off track, just like King Abimelech was, he will speak to you Amen. through a dream. Because he, he must have had a prayer life. Amen. So I'm saying he must have had, must have had a, prayer life. a prayer life. A man who did not look like Abraham. Amen. Who was a Philistine. Uh -huh. These are dark complected people. Who was a Philistine. Well, who was a king. Had a prayer life. Well, a relationship. Now he wasn't perfect. Amen. But those are the people that God uses. Amen. Amen. And I'm running out of time. That's why whenever we we like to laugh. We like to discuss certain issues that occur in the church. And are different men and women in the church who have fallen. Uh -huh. But you always be careful about the anointing of God. Because right. even though a man or woman has fallen, well, their gift is still there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Guys, I'm running out of time. We're dealing with Abraham, a friend of God, an inheritance of faith. Walking through the scriptures, taking pit stops. Taking pit stops. And learning about how we can add these examples to our lives so we won't make the same mistake. Father, I pray for all those under the sound of my voice who may not know you. I pray for them and I pray and extend them an open invitation to the kingdom of heaven. If you'd like to become a son or daughter of God, just say, oh God, oh God I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. I, ask I ask you to forgive me, to forgive me of, all of, of all of my sins. I believe, I believe that, Jesus that, Jesus died, that Jesus died. died. That he was raised to life. That he, was raised to life. he lives forevermore. And he lives forevermore. Now he's real, class. He's real. And I ask the Spirit of God to live in my heart. And I ask the Spirit of God to live now in my heart. Now you're part of the kingdom of heaven. And I 
offer you and I welcome you to continue to watch us or to find a local church which teaches the truth of God. And if you pray to the Heavenly Father, He'll lead you to the right church and the right group of people. And remember, class, the word we speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life.